Uh, Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, mentioned by my colleague, uh, was noted by the New York Times as laboring long and hard in his career, notably in the areas of voter suppression and nativism. He stated last year that he encouraged President Trump to add a question about citizenship to the census during the early weeks of Trump's presidency. Kobach said, quote, I raised the issue with the president shortly after he was inaugurated, and, quote, he was absolutely interested in this. Shortly thereafter, in April of 2017, Steve Bannon asked you to speak to Mr. Kobach about his, quote, ideas about including a citizenship question on the 2020 decennial census. Did you speak to Mr. Kobach about his ideas on the citizenship question? As I described earlier in my testimony, Chris Kobach uh, did have a conversation with me early on in my... So, so you did... I'm sorry, I'm not finished. Chris Kobach did have a conversation with me. He said he had a question he would like us to ask. Thank you. And I saw uh, here, I'm sorry, I must reclaim my time. Mr. Kobach later sent an email to you on July 14th, writing that the lack of the citizenship question, quote, leads to the problem that aliens who do not actually reside in the United States are still counted for congressional apportionment services. Of course, they do reside in the United States. They reside in my district. They're my constituents. But he then wrote, quote, it is essential that one simple question be added to the upcoming 2020 census. It's all there in black and white. Kobach is clear about, the, about his reason for adding the citizenship question in his correspondence to you. And it has nothing to do with the DOJ. It has nothing to do with the Voting Rights Act. It is about congressional apportionment to immigrants. But following that email and its concerning contact, contents, did you cut off all contact with Mr. Kobach, or did you speak with him again? I have no recollection of speaking with him again, actually. Well, we do have a, a, you know, the Southern District of New York has identified a July 25th call between you and Mr. Kobach after that email. Uh, did you bring up Mr. Kobach or his ideas about the citizenship question with anyone in the Commerce Department after Kobach's email? We re I re ultimately rejected the question that Kobach wanted asked. So it does say here, uh, Judge Furman in the Southern District of New York wrote that you, in fact, mentioned Kobach again in a September 6th gen uh, meeting, uh, in a September 6th, in a September 6, 2017 meeting on the citizenship question. In fact, it was so concerning to your own staff that the general counsel expressed, quote, concern about your contact with Kobach and recommended talking to others first. Uh, do you recall anything about that meeting? No, I don't. If you, do have you, a document, if you don't have, if you have a document, I'll be glad to look at it. I'd be happy to, to, uh, to share that. And additionally, um, do you think it would be helpful for us to speak with Mr. Kobach about this matter? I have no idea. The committee has to make its own decisions. All right. Um, one other thing. It's been stated multiple times in this hearing that the question is a, a reinstatement of a previous question. But the last time a citizenship question specifically around citizenship was discussed on the census was in 1950. And I pulled up the old question here. And I know it's tough to see from far away, but I pulled up the old question that was originally on the census in 1950. And I see here that the question that is being proposed for 2020 is quite materially different. So it is not a reinstatement. It is not a, a, to placing again or a restoration of the original question. It is a materially different question. Now, the U.S. Census Act of 1974 requires that if the secretary finds such a change necessary, they must send a report to Congress on the proposed change, when the question is proposed, not when it is decided upon. Was that legally required report to Congress submitted to us? I can't respond to your question about the two documents you held up unless you show them to me. I don't have them. It, I did not ask a question about the documents. I asked if the report that is required of you was submitted to Congress. We, we filed the required report on March 31st, 2017. We filed another required report on March 31st, 2018. 
one last thing. So uh, what we don't have is the required report to Congress. And while there's all of this debate about whether a citizenship question should be included or not included, the question I have is why are we violating the law to include any question whatsoever in the 2020 census? I General believe Lee, she's out of fire, time, Chairman. But you, please do answer the question. I, I don't have any need to respond, sir. You don't have a need to respond? I have no need to respond. Um, okay, well, I'm asking. Can you, could you an answer that question, please? Would you repeat the question, please? We are now in violation of the U.S. Census Act of 1974, which requires you to submit a specific report to Congress ahead of, of any changes that you find necessary. This question is not a reinstatement of the 1950 question. It's a change, which means that change requires you to send a report to us while the question is proposed, not before it is decided or settled. So my question is, why are we violating the law to include this question in the 2020? Well, uh, point, of, point of order. Uh, I, I, we need to, at, at this particular point, the gentlewoman is talking about a statute that's been violated. There's been no enunciation of what that statute is. I don't even know what she's talking about. I'd be happy to provide it. I th yeah, I, I think she laid it out pretty nicely. <laughs> Um, you said it twice. I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm serious. Um, give, give him. But, but in previous testimony, Mr. Sure. Chairman, he it's said that they've, they've submitted reports, and, and and there are three reports required. They submitted the first one and the second one, but not the third one that is required to Congress. And it is in this is here in uh, U.S. Code 13 U.S. Code section 140, 141, Population and Other Census Information, subsection F3. And I'd be happy to provide that to you. Now, I, I noticed that all your, your, I guess those are attorneys back there, squirming uh, around telling you stuff. Can you tell, maybe they, help, they can help us with this answer. Did they tell you what the answer is to that? Um, Got a lot I, of people been, back there. I, I, I've been told by counsel that we have complied with all the regulations. I will take up with counsel the suggestions that have been made by the congressperson and we will get back in due course on the record. As a follow-up on that question, can you give me that in writing, the fact that you complied with the law? And, Mr. Chair, I'd also like to note that, according to uh, our committee staff, there is not compliance with uh, F3. Well, he's going to give me, he said he did, so he's going to give me a statement. He's still sworn. Sure. He's going to give me a statement saying he did. So I'm looking forward to that statement. Thank you. Counsel. Last month, President Trump declared a, quote, national emergency concerning the southern border of the United States under the National Emergencies Act. And, you know, my colleagues wanted to talk about the southern border with relation to the opioid crisis, so let's talk about it. Because even at the time that he declared this emergency, he said himself, quote, I didn't need to do this. But he did. And at the time the president declared this emergency, the White House issued a statement that, quote, he would be using his legal authority to take executive action to secure additional resources, and he's transferred millions of dollars even from FEMA to ICE. The statement said that the administration had identified funding that could be transferred from other agencies as well. This includes up to $2.5 billion that he's transferred from the Department of Defense and up to $3.6 billion reallocated from military construction projects. So that's one national emergency he's identified. But about a year and a half ago, the president issued a declaration indicating that opioids also consist, uh, constitute a public health emergency. Uh, Director Carroll, today, do you, how much funding has the administration transferred from other agencies to address the opioid public health emergency? If you're referring to the opioid emergency that was declared 18 months or so ago, mm -hmm. um, very little money was actually um, transferred over. Um, I'm not sure of the exact amount, but it, it was not very much money. Right. We're seeing here, I mean, there's evidence that almost no money was transferred from other agencies. So we have two national emergencies, one declared on the southern border where the president transfers and ta is taking away millions of dollars from other agencies to address a wall, which doesn't even 
solve these issues when we're seeing that it's focused on ports of entry. Entry, but second, when we actually may I address that actually, in terms of if you just go by weight, and I mean I can break it down by drug if you would like, but when you and the numbers that I have from Customs and Border Protection for 2018 reflects the total weight of drugs at ports of entry in 2018 was 432,000 pounds of various drugs. Between ports of entry for the same time frame, fiscal year 2018, 476,000 pounds. So actually pounds. more even. In terms of total weight, I can break it down by drug if you want. Well, here's my big question I want to ask for the other side. Because it was just a few weeks ago that enough fentanyl was captured to kill 57 million Americans. Remember with this story when this happened? Yeah, just a few weeks back, right? Sir. 50, so if that's not an emergency, somebody tell me what is. Enough fentanyl to kill 58 million, 59 million? I mean, how bad does it have to get before we actually say this is, this is an emergency? Mr. Carroll, is, uh, is there a drug crisis emergency on our southern border? Yes, sir. There's a drug crisis in our country, and all of the drugs that are here are coming into our country, the fatal drugs, are coming from overseas, Mexico, China. I do think that we here in Congress have responsibility as well. The Public Health Emergency Fund has only at most $57,000 in it. And it has not been really funded congressionally in a long time. So I think that that's an area where we can accept some personal responsibility. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. McDaniel, the Democrats have said there's no crisis, no emergency on the southern border. In your judgment, in your, I think, 20-some years of experience, is there an illegal drug crisis, illegal drug emergency on, um, on our southern border? Yes, yes sir. There, there is. is. Yes, sir. Is there uh, a gang and uh, cartel crisis and emergency on our southern border? Yes, sir. And is there also a human trafficking crisis emergency situation on our southern border? Yes, there is. So there is, all three. Yes, sir. We've got a drug emergency, we've got a human trafficking emergency, we've got a gang and cartel emergency on our southern border. Mr. Carroll, is, uh, is there a drug crisis emergency on our southern border? Yes, sir. There's a drug crisis in our country, and all of the drugs that are here are coming into our country, the fatal drugs, are coming from overseas, Mexico, China. Is there also a, a gang and drug cartel problem on our southern border? Um, absolutely. And, There's no and, question. And, and associated with this cartel activity is a human trafficking problem on our southern border. Would you call that an emergency or crisis as well? The, um, and they're absolutely related because these um, traffickers who are just completely morally depraved will trade anything. They'll trade in drugs. They'll trade in weapons. They'll trade in children. They'll trade in human lives. We've got two everything. experts here today, Mr. Chairman, on, the, on our panel, two experts with uh, experience in this area, one 20-some years in law enforcement who says there's a drug crisis emergency, there's a human trafficking crisis emergency, there is a gang and and cartel violence emergency on our district, or on our southern border. Um, let me go back to another point that was raised earlier. One of the uh, earlier members, I believe it was Ms. Washerman Schultz, said 90% of drugs captured are captured at ports of entry. And Mr. Higgins disagreed with that. But let's just assume for a second that Ms. Washerman Schultz is right. Mr. McDaniel, does it surprise you that drugs are captured where there's actually law enforcement personnel? No, sir. No surprise at all. That's kind of common sense, isn't it? Yes. Like, wow, we're actually capturing drugs where there are law enforcement personnel at the ports of entry. <music> where there aren't any good guys to stop them, right? That's correct. Yeah. And hence the reason we need a barrier, hence the reason we need some kind of border security wall to help with that situation, to deal with this crisis that's all over our country, as the director points out. Would you agree with that, Mr. McDaniel? I would agree with that. It's just good common sense. So this argument, this argument that, oh, most of the drugs seized are at ports of entry, well, for goodness sakes, that's where, the, that's where we have law enforcement right there. Of course that's going to happen. But there is all kinds of bad stuff coming across where there aren't the good guys to stop the bad stuff. Mr. McDaniel, would you agree with all that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, to the point Mr. Higgins made, is, is the, how much is actually seized, though, where there aren't ports of any? We're still catching some of it, right? We're yes, still getting some of it. Yes, sir. Is it more or less than what we're getting at the ports of entry? More between the... 
between, so between ports of entry. Democrats say, oh, we're only getting at the ports of entry. Said, well, of course we are. We're getting because we got law enforcement there. But between the ports of entry, out where they can just cross, and there aren't law enforcement personnel right there, uh, we're still capturing some there at some points, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Is it more or less than what we're getting at the ports of entry? There's no way to tell because we the big unknown is what are we missing? Yeah, of course. Obviously, we're missing a lot. Of course. Of course. 